Listener-supported St. Gabriel Catholic Radio AM820 brings you Dominican Dimensions, a half hour of lively discussion about Catholic issues from a Dominican perspective, featuring the friars from St. Patrick Church in Columbus. And now, Dominican Dimensions. Welcome to the Dominican Dimensions, a half hour of lively discussion about Catholic issues from a Dominican perspective. My name is Father Stephen Alcott, and I'm a friar at St. Patrick Priory in Columbus. Today I'm joined in the studio by Father Paul Marich. Let's begin with a prayer to Our Lady. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today's topic is liturgical prayer, but liturgical prayer outside of the Mass. Mm -hmm. Most people think of the liturgy primarily as the Mass, and that's right. our main, that's our main um, touch point right. with, with the liturgy, is, is, is the liturgy that we, that we pray at Mass. But I remember, there are other. I remember as a kid going to Catholic school, like the word liturgy was synonymous with Mass. Right. It's like, well, we have a liturgy today. All right, but you know it was, it was going to mass. <laughs> That's true. So. Yeah, yeah. It's almost in fact when you say liturgy, some people think automatically that must mean the mass. Right. But there are other ways of prayer that don't involve the mass that are that are still part of the prayer, the the liturgy of the church. Mm -hmm. um, the main two we're going to talk about today are the liturgy of the hours, right, and then uh, Eucharistic devotions, especially Eucharistic adoration. Mm -hmm. um, in a lesser sense, we will talk a little bit about some of the sacraments which we which we can receive more than once, such right. as the sacrament of confession and anointing, which have right. a small liturgy that's attached sure. to them. But mainly we're going to speak about the liturgy of the hours and mm -hmm. the liturgy that we by which we express devotion to Christ in the Eucharist right. outside of Mass. Right. So, you know, Father Stephen, for you and I as Dominican friars, the liturgy of the hours really has a it's integral to our life because we pray the Liturgy of the Hours, as Dominican friars in common mm -hmm. in the house. You know, this is something that uh, from day one, when we entered the novitiate, uh, we were taught how to pray the Liturgy of the Hours, and mm -hmm. we have our own, uh, you could say, like customs and in the way we celebrate the office. And what we say uh, in a particular way, we, we celebrate it in choir, which means right. the way in which we are seated in our chapel, uh, singing the liturgy, you know, singing the psalms of the liturgy of the hours, but the liturgy of the hours, what's important to men, you know, it's it sometimes is called the divine office, right? Uh, another name for it. Uh, but with the liturgy of the hours, what we are praying is the prayer of the church, as it's right. called. And what does that mean? It's that this is the prayer that is universal that throughout the church all over the world. Mm -hmm that people are able to pray this prayer and you are united with everyone else, mm. that you are praying for all those other, all others in the church. Right. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a great app, one of the, uh, the mobile apps for praying uh, the liturgy of the hours where it shows like who's using the app at that moment in the world. Oh, wow. You could oh. see like the, you know, who's at prayer, uh, different spot, like little kind of little lights on different spots in the world, but it is the prayer of the church. And so that's always what is something to remember. It's not just, you know, a, a random vocal prayer that you're mm -hmm. making to the Lord. And it's not a devotion either. In other words, devotions tend to have a sense of maybe like a devotion to a saint or some aspect of our Lord's life, um, you know, maybe asking for a favor uh, as part of it or, you know, just showing one's love to uh, our Lord or to a saint. With the Liturgy of the Hours, there is a structure to, right. to that prayer. Uh, that one follows, just as there's a structure to the Mass. So it's not, a, uh, it's not something just prayed at random or spontaneously. Mm -hmm. right. uh, there's also, with the, uh, the understanding, and we call it the Liturgy of the Hours, because it's the sense of sanctifying time. Right. There are several hours throughout the day where, and it's not every hour, it's not as if there's like 24 prayers mm -hmm. you know, every hour of the day, right. but what it means is that there are set hours throughout the day mm -hmm. uh, that are meant to sanctify time, where we read in the scriptures, seven times a day I will praise you, Lord. Right. And that kind of takes that mindset, or what St. Paul even said, to pray at all times. Right. And so, uh, you know, for us who are members of, you know, a religious community, there is that sense of, you know, like we stop 
our whatever we're doing to go pray vespers. You know, there's that sense right. of of the time is sanctified, uh, and uh, certainly for like monastic communities uh, where you know they might be working and they they're going to even pray more hours of of the divine office each day. Uh, right. You know, where it's really breaks throughout the day, stopping whatever you're doing to go pray so that the whole day is sanctified and then fulfilling those commands of to pray at all times. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And that's, that's important because any liturgy, any mm-hmm. liturgical prayer is a prayer prayed as part of the church. Mm-hmm. Um, I could make up my own prayer, but I'm praying as an individual. But if I pray right. the liturgy of the hours, I'm joining my prayer, um, whether I realize it or not, hopefully mm-hmm. realizing it, to the prayer of, of everyone praying the divine office, the liturgy of the hours throughout the world. Right. And you know, you were mentioning uh, the different hours of the day. I think mm-hmm. uh, the full office, which would be prayed by some more monastic communities right. or, or cloistered nuns, would involve in praying basically seven times a day. Mm-hmm. You know, you right. have um, uh, vigils or morning, you know, which right. we would call office of readings. Office of readings, matins sometimes. Matins, yeah. which could be very early right. that you'd have... And in laws. the monastic tradition, there's a, like with vigils, there's this the sense of breaking your sleep, getting mm-hmm. up in the middle of the night to pray, right, and then going back to sleep until morning. Yeah. So, but so they'd have morning prayer, uh, mid morning prayer, midday prayer, mid afternoon prayer, then evening prayer, right, and then night prayer. So, right. So pretty much almost every, like every three, three hours, hours yeah. you're praying mm-hmm. part of the liturgy of the hours, and so you you are literally consecrating. You never go. With that, even six right. hours of any day or night right. without prayer. You know? In fact, the the three what are called the little hours or the the daytime hours, their Latin names ter sex to known, are actually based on the third, sixth, and ninth hour of the day. Right. You know, what we would call nine a.m., noon, and three p.m. Right. Uh, so the that sense of every three hours stopping what one is doing to pray. Hmm. Yeah. So so it's a way of sanctifying time. The liturgy of the hours goes mm-hmm. all the way back. Um, at least to the time of of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, Christ would have learned uh, certain prayers by heart, certain psalms that he would have prayed in the morning and in the evening and certain special Mm -hmm. celebrations and feasts. Right, and you you just said it there with the psalms. You know, what is the, could you say, is at the the core of the Liturgy of the Hours, it's praying psalms. Every office of the day has psalms involved. These prayers, you know, the the Old Testament prayer book, Mm-hmm. Uh, which is prayed, but what's key is also remember we are praying them as Christians. You know, we pray mm-hmm. them as seeing how they are fulfilled in Christ. Right. You know, so oftentimes when we hear Psalms that t- talk about the King, you know, maybe in the context in which they were written, it's referring to King David. Mm-hmm. But we now pray them as Christians. We see the King mm-hmm. is our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's always something too with these prayers that are very ancient that are from the Old Testament, but what we see how they are fulfilled in Christ. And that's the other thing, too, where, you know, like, say, morning prayer, for example, uh, the the prayers might be, the psalms might be very different. So, like, on a Friday, every Friday in morning prayer, you pray Psalm 51, right. the Miserere, which is the psalm of David after his great sin, you know, asking for the Lord's mercy, because we it's the day of the Lord's passion. Mm-hmm. On that Friday, we're invoking God's mercy in a special way. So it's a, right. it's a somber psalm. It's a penitential psalm. But then there's always, on, in the morning prayer, the last psalm is always a psalm of praise right. because the morning is meant to reflect the glory of Christ's resurrection every morning, not just Sunday mornings, mm-hmm. but every morning with the new rising sun. Mm-hmm. We remember that Christ, the Son of God, rose. And mm-hmm. Likewise, there's a, you know, a distinction there for between morning prayer and then vespers at the evening prayer, where there's more of a remembrance of Christ's passion, of his passing mm-hmm. uh, from, you know, from this life to the tomb, but then knowing, you know, three days later he rose. So even what we see in the cycle of the day, you know, mm-hmm. the setting sun yeah. at vespers and the rising sun of the next day, you know, that that all plays into that sanctifying of time and the types of prayers, the types of psalms that we pray at those times of day. Right. Yeah, so just as when we attend Mass, the main liturgical prayer that most Catholics are familiar with, mm-hmm. it creates a certain rhythm mm-hmm. in your life, a rhythm of the week, right. because you go to Mass on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, it creates a rhythm in the liturgical seasons. Right. You know, so uh, 
so it creates a liturgical rhythm in terms of certain feast days of, mm-hmm. of saints that come up. So, so it does, it creates a whole rhythm for your life. Right. And, and, and this is the thing, Father, if someone can't go to daily Mass, I mean, they, they, they desired right. to, but just because of their schedule or you know, the travel involved, they can't get to daily Mass, you can still pray the Liturgy of the Hours. Because remember, the Liturgy of the Hours is not a devotion. It is, right. it is a liturgy. But it's also, a, right. in a, and it's a liturgy that you could do in a very solemn way, like we do here at St. Patrick's, you know, say on the Sundays of Advent, where we mm-hmm. have solemn vespers, or, you know, as a Dominican community, we pray the Liturgy of the Hours in common. But it's also something you can pray in your living room. Right. And you're, you're praying a liturgical prayer. You're praying the prayer of the church. And, you know, that's also something, too, with you, with you mentioned how that cycle of the liturgical seasons or the saints, mm-hmm. you know, that... Just as you know, a saint's feast day, which you might remember at Mass, you're going to hear their name mentioned in the prayers. Mm-hmm. It's the same with the Liturgy of the Hours. So, right. you know, if you do go to daily Mass, you know, the Liturgy of the Hours is a good, a, um, you know, complement to that because the the whatever feast day you might be remembering at the celebration of the Eucharist, you're also going to have in the celebration of the of the Divine Office. Right. You're listening to The Dominican Dimensions, a half hour of lively discussion about Catholic issues from a Dominican perspective. My name is Father Stephen Alcott, and I'm a friar at St. Patrick Priory in Columbus. Today I'm joined in the studio by Father Paul Marich, and we've been discussing different types of liturgical prayer mm-hmm. other than the Mass, and we've been discussing the Liturgy of the Hours in right. particular. And I think for anyone, you know, if maybe some of our listeners already pray the Liturgy of the Hours, and you know, for us as priests, we're bound by canon law. Mm-hmm. We have to pray uh, the whole liturgical, the whole Liturgy of the Hours. Now there's daytime prayer. It's specified there, there's three hours. We have an option of one of those three to pick from, whereas like a, mo- a monastery of of say cloistered nuns or monks they're going to pray all three right you know so for like us as as priests and this is the same for diocesan priests you know, we're required to pray the office of readings morning prayer one of the daytime hours evening prayer and a night prayer and right. then different religious communities of of non-ordained men or of women religious communities they're usually going to pray most if not all of the liturgy of the hours you know they're not bound mm-hmm. as we are as priests by right. canon law, but they may be bound by their own mm-hmm. laws and constitutions. For the laity, though, you know, there's no requirement to pray the Liturgy of the Hours, but it is a good way you know, to engage in liturgical prayer, and it might be something that, you know, maybe to start off slowly, like maybe someone starting with just morning prayer, just evening prayer. Maybe the, you know, those are seen as the two hinges mm-hmm. of the Liturgy of the Hours. So maybe for someone who is a... Uh, you know, a, a lay person, a working person, a student, that might be all that you can do on a certain day. And that's fine. You know, it's, yeah. it's a good start. No one's expecting, you know, someone to pray the whole uh, Liturgy of the right. Hours, you know, if, if that's not what is required for your state in life. So. Yeah, but you'll notice when you pray the Liturgy of the Hours, it takes a little bit of learning and doing because it's, it is a little bit more formal than most right. kinds of prayer. But again, there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. It's because we're praying with the church. Just like at Mass, mm-hmm. you know, um, we don't, we don't, we don't uh, mm-hmm. change around things of the mass, you right. know, just because we feel like it, you know, because right. it's it's a it's part of the the churches, but the prayer belongs yeah. to the church. It doesn't belong to me personally. It belongs to the church. Right. And same with liturgy of the hours. I mean, it's it's a little bit more formal, but as we learn it, you know, we we know that we're not the only one praying it. Somewhere on on the planet, you know, yeah. many 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 other people are praying right. that same hour of prayer yes. using. Virtually the same words, possibly in a different language, but right. basically the same the same right. psalms. Right, and then um, you know what is produced in terms of the books that can be used. You know, there's many people are probably familiar with the four volume set, the Liturgy of the Hours, right. which is based on you know there's an Advent and Christmas volume, a Lent and Easter volume, and then two volumes for Ordinary Time. There's a shorter condensed version of that Christian prayer, which has the two hinge hours, and then modified versions of the other hours there's even a shorter christian prayer which is right. even more condensed you know if you're right. maybe more on the go although i've heard like now that there's mobile apps you know, like we're mentioning yeah. that you know they have the liturgy of the hours that's become very popular and that avoids you know needing to do all the flipping back and that's forth right. it's just, it just kind of all you have to do is scroll up and uh, yeah. <laughs> there there's your office right there so yeah one popular one that i use sometimes is i breviary yeah you can find i breviary in mm-hmm. 
for any phone. Yep. Um, so that just and one one book I recommend if someone really wants to learn about mm-hmm. the Liturgy of the Hours, it's a book called uh, The Divine Office: A School of Christian, A School of Prayer for All Christians mm-hmm. by John Brook B R O O K. You can find it online. It's a great book. It's what our novice master gave gave to our class when we were just learning right. how to pray. It, mm-hmm. The first part of the book talks about the, a little bit about the history of the Liturgy of the Hours, where it came from, mm-hmm. you know, why it is what it is today. But in the, the second two-thirds of the book, it actually gives as a very brief commentary on the Psalms themselves. Because the Psalms that we pray um, are beautiful, and they're classic, and they're divinely inspired, but they're not exactly the same language we might use in the 21st century. Right. So um, so it, it gives a commentary, for mm-hmm. example, but it goes in order that the Psalms appear in morning and evening prayer. So right. it'd be like Sunday morning prayer week one, mm-hmm. it gives a commentary on those three Psalms. So again, John Brooke, the school of the divine office, a school of prayer for, mm-hmm. for, for Christians. Um, so that's a good way to get started with those of the hours. So why don't we talk also about another mm-hmm. kind of liturgical prayer, uh, Eucharistic adoration. Right, and sometimes you know we may not necessarily think of this as a liturgical prayer because uh, you know a lot of times uh, if you've co- gone to adoration, say if it's a perpetual adoration chapel at your parish or mm-hmm. a mostly per- perpetual, some places may not have it during the night, but they do have adoration all day, or if maybe during adoration there's a lot of devotions going on like different litanies or the rosary or different other prayers, you know, to the Eucharistic Christ. It may not seem liturgical, but really, you know, it's it's important to remember, well, first of all, how did we get the Eucharist in the monstrance in the first place? Well, you had to have a celebration of Mass. Right. You know, a host had to be offered and sacrificed at Mass, consecrated to become the body and blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. So this is why we, we see with Eucharistic adoration that there, it's an extension of Mass. You right. know, it allows what we celebrate in the Mass for us to now, in a way, sit back and ponder that more deeply. You know, to contemplate our Lord who is here in the Eucharist, and remember, it's the same Lord who is in the Tabernacle. You know, it's closed. It's not. You know, that obviously going to Eucharistic adoration, seeing our Lord in the monstrance, it helps us. You could, and I think it even helps deepen our faith because. We're able to actually see our Lord, mm. uh, you know, there in the monstrance. But it's not as if somehow, you know, uh, the, the Blessed Sacrament is less Jesus when right. you know He's behind the tabernacle door. It's our same Eucharistic Lord, but this just gives us a more, uh, you know, intimate connection with our Lord, so we could adore Him uh, in the monstrance. But what we also find too is that you know the norm is that when the Blessed Sacrament is exposed. It's supposed to be part of a liturgical celebration. Mm-hmm. So uh, you have the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, where uh, you know the, the priest or the deacon brings the Blessed Sacrament from the tabernacle, puts our Lord in the monstrance, incenses the Blessed Sacrament. These are liturgical acts. Mm-hmm. There's a singing of a hymn, the O Salutaris, and then at the end of adoration with benediction, which benediction is a liturgy. Right. There was a right. debate about that for a while. And I think it was Pope Pius XII uh, confirmed uh, in the 1950s. Benediction is a liturgy. Mm-hmm. It's not a devotion. Right. So that's why it's, you know, you just can't with benediction kind of do benediction however you want. No, right. there's an actual structure to follow mm-hmm. uh, that the church has prescribed. And, uh, you know, to end the adoration where you are blessed uh, with the Blessed Sacrament, you know, but in a very formal way. Again, you know, you have incense, you have hymns. You know, the priest is vested uh, in a certain way. And so that's also why when you have periods of Eucharistic adoration, you know, you're not supposed to have exposition just for the sake of then having benediction right away, right. which I think in earlier decades that that was actually a practice in some mm-hmm. parishes where it was kind of more like, well, let me get the blessing with the Eucharist, and, you know, it's just kind of a quick exposition, and then, <laughs> boom, right, right, right. to, uh, add it to uh, benediction. And the church has made clear that, no, that there is supposed to be some time of silent prayer mm. before the Blessed Sacrament, before benediction. Uh, likewise, even if, 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 say, like, you have a parish, you know, or a community that has a time, like a holy hour each, you know, or each week, or maybe mm-hmm. several times a week where there is exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, that whole time 
you know, is not supposed to be spent with just like one devotion after another. There's meant to be right. some time for silent yes. prayer that's built into that time of adoration before you have, that's built into that time of exposition before you go on to benediction. Right, right. Yeah, so, yeah, so this Eucharistic adoration, even though in some ways it's not, <clears throat> I mean, other than the beginning and the end, exposition and benediction, Otherwise, even though it's not quite as structured to say the Liturgy of the Hours, the Liturgy of the Hours, and you're praying that, mm -hmm. it's structured from beginning to end. Right. You know, the adoration, um, worship of the Eucharist outside of Mass, you know, how you pray between exposition and then benediction, is there's really a lot of ways you can do that, and it could even just be in silence. But, but yeah, the right. key is you, need, you should have some time period of silence. Right. Uh, it's because, yeah, it's because Christ is... And Christ should be the main focus, mm -hmm. you know, of the prayer that happens during adoration as well. Right. Which is what, like, you know, uh, what are different things you could do during adoration? Like, okay, the rosary is acceptable. St. Mm -hmm. John Paul II said that. Even though it's a Marian devotion, it's ultimately Christocentric. Right. Because you're meditating on the uh, events in the life of Christ. You know, it's a, uh, the Liturgy of the Hours can be prayed during uh, right. Eucharistic adoration. Uh, but then it's, you know, you could, you can have some time for, you know, maybe reading, whether it's of sacred scripture or some other, um, you know, mm -hmm. spiritual work, really to help, you could say, stir up uh, some reflection during that time of prayer. Because uh, if, you know, right. that could be the hard part, then when you go into adoration, you sit down and it's just like, you don't know what to say, you know. Right. Um, <clears throat> You know, or you fall asleep. You know, Fulton Sheen had a, a a famous line about you know, he asked his guardian angel, "Is it okay if I fall asleep during my holy hour?" And the response was, "Yes." The apostles did it the first one. You know, there in the Garden <laughs> of Gethsemane. But uh, right. you know, the uh, there is that sense of because of the quiet, because of the contemplation involved, there could also be a risk of just you don't know what to pray. You know, or right. you that that time of utter silence then can feel like forever uh, when mm -hmm. it's really only two minutes or something. So that's, you know, there is, I think, something to be, you know, laudable with like taking a book in, you know, to just kind of yeah. help, um, you know, get to meditate upon uh, as you pray before the Blessed Sacrament. Right. There's a great, one of the Gospels when Jesus talks about calling his apostles, he says he calls his apostles to be with him and then to preach and cast out demons. But the right. first thing was to be with him right. first. Um, and and they spent a lot of time, I mean, the, the original 12 apostles spent a lot of time being with Jesus. They were with him for some three years. Only what we have in the Gospels is only a very small, small section of, of the total things of what he said and did mm -hmm. you know, during those three years of public ministry. Right. So, so just being with Jesus, that's important for adoration because the, the whole point of of extending Christ's uh, uh, exposition in the Eucharist, right. which normally is just for a few moments at Mass at the consecration. Right. The whole point of that is so that we can be with mm -hmm. Him to spend time in His presence. Right. And a lot of places, you know, depending on if you have like a holy hour where it's literally just an hour, you know, exposition mm -hmm. at the beginning, and you know, there's silent prayer, maybe a few devotions, and then you end with benediction. Uh, maybe it's an all-day thing, so some parishes may have like exposition at after the morning mass, and it goes all day until at some point in mm -hmm. the evening with benediction. Uh, there is uh, different things that could be done during that time, and people may come and go, uh, as, and especially like a, a parish with perpetual adoration, where you never really get to experience the liturgical ends of adoration right. with you know the rite that is involved in exposition and. And benediction, but I think it's important, especially if that, like, say, if you go to a weekly holy hour at an adoration chapel, or if maybe mm -hmm. at your parish you stop in, kind of while it's kind of an ongoing thing during the day. Always remember that this was some that this time of adoration was something that begins and ends in a liturgical right. action. You're in a way entering in to the middle of a liturgical right. of a liturgical action. Right, and just with the last part of this this uh, mm -hmm. broadcast, uh, we could talk a little bit about some of the sacraments that right. we receive. The right. sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of penance or confession. Uh, but if you notice, when you go to confession, it's very short usually, mm -hmm. but there's actually a liturgy. Right, and there is an option 
where you could actually have a short scripture mm-hmm. passage. I don't know how that would work here at St. Patrick's with all the confessions. <laughs> that, the lines are already long enough if we were. Right. But there is. Uh, but then, like some places, especially during Advent and Lent, where you may have a communal celebration of penance, where there's right. a liturgy of the word before going off to make your individual confession. You know, and even with anointing of the sick. You know, like a lot of times in a hospital, it might be an emergency situation mm-hmm. where you have to do the bare minimum of, of the rite itself. But if you have time, you know, there's really an, ex- an expanded liturgy there with the gospel reading right. and a litany and some other prayers uh, with the, the, the rite of anointing being there as the focal point of it. So. Right, right. There's a clear beginning and end. You know, confession mm-hmm. begins and ends with the sign of the cross. Right. You know, the known of the sick begins and ends with the sign of the and cross. And some of our listeners may have been at weddings that are not at Mass, you know, especially mm-hmm. if it's a marriage between a Catholic and a non-Catholic. Usually that's done in a simple ceremony where there's a liturgy of the Word and then the rite of marriage then ending with the nuptial blessing. But it's still liturgical. It's right. not, it's not, there's a structure there's a prescribed text, you know, there's an order to the worship. Right, because when we're, just as at Mass, we're not, we're, we're celebrating the Mass of the Church, you know, uh, we're also celebrating the sacraments with the Church, the, the prayers of the Church. are not our, our, our own prayers individually, they belong to the Church as a whole, and, and so they belong to us as the Church, as, as the body of Christ. Thank you for joining us today for the Dominican Dimensions. My name is Father Stephen Alcott, and I'm a friar at St. Patrick Priory in Columbus. Today I've been joined in the studio by Father Paul Merich. Let's end with prayer invoking the intercession of our holy founder, St. Dominic. O light, o light of, of the, the church, church, teacher of truth, rose of patience, ivory of chastity, freely you have poured forth, forth the waters of wisdom, preacher of grace, unite us with the blessed. Amen. Amen. Dominican Dimensions is a production of listener-supported St. Gabriel Catholic Radio AM820. Archives of Dominican Dimensions and all of our locally produced programs are available at stgabrielradio.com. Veni Sancti